have in lack connection and you know, you had spoken about that as far as getting our client connected in that area. And I just, I guess I just kind of want to understand a little bit more about the importance of, I, I just, you know, I hear a lot about that. And I guess I just feel like I'd like to some more information about that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let me give um, Kim and Genevieve a little background on this client. So this is, we've talked about this client before. She is a really interesting client because she is very hypermobile. And she has an, a hip issue, which is osteoarthritic. Um, interestingly, she just had the x-ray um, and saw the doctor about the hip. The hip is her, right hip is her limiting factor, her biggest limiting factor. Um, it's, she was in a car accident uh, years ago. The hip has been an issue ever since. Um, and so she went back in, she hasn't had it looked at in a long time. The situation with the hip has been getting worse. And I've, we've been working really hard. I've been working with her and Allegra has been working with her to try and mitigate what's going on at her hip, but it's gotten to the point where she really can't go for a walk anymore. She can't um, really, she gets pain. She's pain every day. She's, she can't get the muscles around her hip to fire, which is really classic hip dysfunction right they all the complaint I get a lot with these thing with hip dysfunction is that my muscles aren't firing around my hip at all I can't get my glutes on the muscles don't turn on the leg doesn't want to work right that's sort of the a lot of times for the people who are body aware a little bit that that's the complaint so she um has a hard time with that whole side the other thing is the hypermobility, right, is in her whole body. And well, like we were working on this today, actually, with how do we connect? So the whole, the lats, if you think about the lat attachment points, right, they are from iliac, back posterior iliac crest, from the fascia, the thoracolumbar fascia up this way, under the arm, right, to the anterior shoulder. Yeah. So it's a huge span of muscle. And if the lats are tight, they can immediately rotate the shoulder, right? So that's not a good thing. Um, if they're not working though, there, there's so much fascia and so much connection and diagonal fibers that if they're not working, they can counter the abs. But if they're not working, we don't have that connection from top to bottom a lot. And in somebody who's strong, even if their lats are tight, they're going to be fine. In somebody who's hypermobile and not very strong, if the, lat, the lats can play a huge role in helping them get where they need to be posturally. So today I was working with her also on things in standing. And we didn't get beyond ball squeeze between the legs today, so which is this one. Right, I have her take the ball, put it in between her legs. Right, and then we couldn't, I was trying to have her squeeze the ball. I should just get a little further away from you so you can see. And she could not get. All right, so I was having her squeeze the ball, but she would either give me squeeze the ball, or she'd give me squeeze the ball. I could not get her. There's a big hypermobility point for her right here. I couldn't get her to just squeeze the ball and lift straight up through her body and stay neutral and stay connected through. We, she was just, she would break either there or she'd shove her pelvis forward. She just could not get control over this part in connection to her upper body at all today. So um, what do you do with that? So this is why in the past with her, I've come not from this direction, but from the upper direction. And so I took the legs and feet out of the picture and had her sit and do double lap pulls, right? Why double lap pulls? Double lap pulls for me are that getting taller idea without having to have the legs involved, right? So seated, we get rid of those legs. We can work on this pulling down, trying to find this connection here to give her some stability, right? to help her find that stability across the spine. Granted, 
The other things that connect, what are the other things that would, would help her with that stability, not just lots? muted um just the the postural mode, like if their glutes were working that would have helped her or but are you saying just in that position yeah and seated oh um are her serratus like pulling helping the lats mm -hmm. in there um that would keep that would definitely keep her shoulder blades on so that would help her if serratus was firing properly that would definitely help her get to the lats mm -hmm. but what about stabilizing that this lower spine stuff it's you know what it is um, the abs the abs yeah the abs yeah it was so obvious i just see <laughs> the abs but there is something else there's something else that maybe a little less obvious in the back the multifidi back yes, there you are multifidi Okay, and so those are now, if we take away rectus and we talk about deep abs, we're talking about what direction of fibers? The deep, the transverse? The seat, the seat. Transverse is this way, yeah. right? Obliques are this way and this way. Yeah. And lats and the thoracolumbar fascia are which way? Yes, that way, right? So you, can you see the picture now? We're going diagonally everywhere and multifidi are what direction are they just like this no they're actually diagonal oh. so they're um from oh they go they go don't they transverse to spinous transverse to spinous process so they're like diagonal they, they braid up right mm -hmm. two yeah. or three levels above so they're going okay. diagonally upward the multifidi also. So all those stabilizing fibers that we're talking about are all diagonal. Thoracolumbar fascia is diagonal. It's all these diagonal lines that are going to create this support for her center. Mm. Right. So if we can get lats firing in the back and obliques firing in the front, we're going to end up pancaking her and transverse, of course, we're gonna end up pancaking her right into a stable cast body, right? And that's what we're after. So having somebody like her who has a hip dysfunction, try and get her abs to really fire when things don't fire in the way they should, is really challenging, right? Laying her down and taking her legs and tabletop and doing a series of five with her. Have you tried that? No, uh, no I've, I've not tried that yet, no. Yes. And why haven't you tried that? She, she's just not stable enough to even just like hold herself there. I mean, she has a hard time with the, even the, the bridging and coccyx curl and yeah. Right. And so you know that it's not going to work. Yeah. <laughs> so you haven't done it, right? Yeah. Which is exactly right. I haven't done it either because I know it's, it's not the way for her. She's not going to get the right muscles to fire. She's going to go right to rectus and psoas to try and hold herself there. Yeah, so what can we go for are those that we can go for the lats to help situate her from the back. Multifidi will kick in, trying to hold her there as well. We can work on the abs while she's seated there and we've taken the legs out of the picture. And so the whole, the whole lat pulls getting taller is actually, and that whole thing about lifting up your butt and feeling like you're actually growing, is this compression front to back. So we're actually working on that exact thing, core stability. Yeah, and we're doing it with this. This just makes you feel like you can get there. Some, if they can connect, they can start to feel like, oh wait, I've got something going on here. And it doesn't have to be that same feeling. You can do it that way. You can do it with the bar. Actually, we did that too. I don't remember if we did today. That same one I was showing you for the hip tight hip flexors, right? Kneeling. Oh, you guys did that one? Okay. I did that standing with her. Maybe yeah, that. you can absolutely do it standing. I just didn't want to deal with the legs. Yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> right? So I just wanted to make it easier for myself. So, and then for somebody who's unstable, sitting on their sit bones really can help stabilize the pelvis. If you can at least get her into sitting posture, she rocks her pelvis way forward too and still goes for lumbar extension. Poor thing, she's not doing it on purpose. It just happens because she she can. She just moves so much. Mm -hmm. So um, 
So those are great ways. The other way would be supine lat pulls and that would be another way to try and get it uh, in supine. So the reformer arm, arm series is actually not my favorite one because I feel like it's hard for people. This is the tendency to roll forward, right? Rather than keep back and pull down. Whereas in other positions, we can do a better job of getting them open and pulling down. So they're really getting the back body or even seated. Uh, I like the seated better because we get the back body really firing more easily with those. So does that help? Uh, yeah, that, that helps. Um, just it's, I mean, it's so obvious that I guess I overlooked it, but just, you know, no. the labs are connecting to everything there the, and kind of having it all those diagonals. It's like, a, yeah, like the corset in there, just making it strong and holding it Having all those things work together to hold her up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, and I think uh, we can, we need to rely on somebody who's hypermobile like that. You need to rely on everything you can get to hold them stable, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily just the route you would take with somebody who's more stable and just has a little back injury, right? Then you're going to go for their abs. We have plenty of clients like that where we just go, we're going to go right to the fives. We're going to stabilize their abs. We're going to get their hamstring stretch, their piriformis stretch, and they're going to be out the door. And we know that there are plenty of clients like that. This situation is not one of those. This is one of those where you've got to find a way to get her to stabilize herself without ever really going through what we classically would go through to get there, you know, without holding tabletop, without uh, doing the fives, without even being able to do like simple things like predict the load are challenging for her. And um, so, yeah. It's, yeah. It is a black diamond client, double dot black diamond client. <laughs> double dot black diamond, <laughs> yes, it is. But you're doing a great job, yeah. So, um, so yeah. Great. Kim, are you, do you have anyone else, Allegra? Are you good? Good. All right. Do you want to, do you want me to present my, my case study person? 50 year old man with a history of lumbar facet joint dysfunction and pelvic instability. Spent the last year hiking and mountain biking relatively pain free. After several months of backpacking and a trip to the Mont Blanc, 10 days hut to hut hiking is basically what he did. He decides to come home and back off the hiking and backpacking and restart running, which is his winter sport of choice. He wants to be smart and starts with three, three mile runs a week. On the second week of his regime, he has a sharp pain in his lower left hip pelvis region and feels that his whole left side goes into spasm from lower back to the buttocks. He comes in to do Pilates. He's been doing a home exercise program for core strength the whole time and reports that walking uphill is the thing that gives him the most relief of anything else from anything else. So I just wanted to throw this out. This is an actual client. I think some of you know who this is, but this is, um, it, it was, it's interesting because I wanted to throw it out there and have you try and think through what could what could have gone wrong? And if so, I mean, if you think of somebody with facet joint dysfunction and pelvic instability who's totally in shape to hike 10, I think they did 10 and over over 10 miles a day for 10 days straight with a backpack on, right? No never run but this person has run every runs every year in the winter that's what he does in the winter just because he doesn't want to go on super long hikes and get he wants to get his workout in uh, so he's come back to running why on earth would this running three three miles runs a week from hiking 10 12 miles a day for 10 days straight with a backpack on, like what would, why would that happen? Any thoughts or ideas? Um, I guess I'm just thinking that 
with hiking, well, first of all, I was wearing different shoes for sure. Um, but with hiking, you're, and especially wearing a backpack, you're going to be a little bit more forward using maybe your quads more than you would use your back body. Um, that's all I got so far to start. Hey, so I'm going to just write down some notes because I like what you're saying here. So um, thoughts here. So position. Position, is yeah, different. body position. Mm -hmm. um, of the body, okay, with backpack. Um, I was also thinking maybe something about the um, the motion of running, like it's you're kind of jumping. Maybe that had something to do with it. Yeah, the impact for sure. Impact, uh, impact. Yeah, yeah, yes. So, so greater, greater impact. Um, what about the back swing of the leg and the running motion versus hiking? You're not really taking as big of an extension through that hip into the back. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Especially if he. Uh, gets relief hiking uphill he's actually activating the glute and the back chain potentially a little bit more which is pulling that opposite direction from the load of the back is that right mm. that's, that's that's very very, very good, good almost right, right. <laughs> so relief with walking uphill uh Yes, really forming a pill because back chain of the body is activating. Well, it's also kind of on stretch a little bit, right? The back chain. The front chain would be stretching, right? The hip flexor. Is that what you're thinking? Like so when you're hiking uphill. Oh. I think it'd be, it'd be hard on the, the hip back. flexors and the back would get a little bit of that, a little bit of uh, release. Right. Depending. Okay. So like uh, you're thinking the muscles that kind of the glutes, the hamstrings go on stretch when you're hiking uphill. I'm thinking more. Yeah. Yeah. Or even just the lower back muscles. Is that a lower back? Position. Okay. Yeah. But, okay. So lower back. Um, on stretch, going uphill. Um, um, Definitely sh shortening in the hip flexors. So from the uphill, mm -hmm. right? So maybe it, it is a different position of the hip flexors, the psoas muscles, much okay. different position for the psoas muscles. I would say his uh, quads are very tight and they might need to be, they might need some more space to make, uh, that's why it might be causing some of this pain too. That's what I would say. Okay. Oops, please. Okay. So, okay. I think these are all great hypotheses. Let's think about, Genevieve, you also said about the glutes um, firing when he's going, um, when he's running a little bit more. Um, maybe. Maybe. Oh, when he's having a Because it could be running to do that. Okay, hiking uphill. You're right, hiking uphill, and that's what's giving some relief. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Okay, great. So let's do this. Tell me what's causing. Uh, okay, I'm going to tell me of these things. What do you think is causing the pain? Or what do you think might be the, the biggest chance that that's actually the reason that he's having pain with running versus hiking? It might be adding to his pelvic instability because of the, the vibration of the impact. 
because the okay, theory of you. public instability. Yeah. Okay, that's exactly what I think. So right here, Allegra, you said motion of running, greater impact, hopping from one leg to the other. And the reason that that is challenging, that is super challenging on the SI joint. Challenging, channeling, challenging on the SI joint, right? So that is a big shear on the SI joint. When you go back, when you haven't been running, I tell all my clients and I told him, I said, running hurts. The first time you go running, if you haven't been running, it doesn't matter how fit you are, running hurts. And especially for somebody with instability at the SI joint, running's gonna hurt. I think Genevieve, I've said this to you too. <laughs> some point but um it's it's gonna hurt because it's load it's that one leg load the hopping from one leg to the other so that might explain part of what's going on and that's definitely what entered my head the only thing that doesn't really follow that is that lower um he has the sharp in his left lower hip pelvis that could be si joint but then his whole left side goes into spasm from the lower back to the buttocks and he had a history of lumbar facet dysfunction. I didn't say this, but it was on the left. Mm -hmm. I put that in there. Mm -hmm. On the left um, in the past. So what do you think might happen if, if we start, say that that's what happened, right? That he got a shear or a rotation or the SI joint what became came out of alignment. And then he goes, what happens to his body? What, what's a typical response when something goes out of joint or out of alignment? Freeze. I mean, he might have a, a nerve or something, but yeah, he, your body just kind of freezes, spasms. Freezes, spasms, spasms. spasms. Yeah. Exactly right. And that pain can travel, right? Mm -hmm. And then if you're stuck in a spasm and you still have to move, what do you do? You guard. You guard you, and you find yeah. a way around it, right? Yeah. Exactly. You compensate. Yeah. You compensate. You find a way around it. And if you have a weak spot just above the point of injury, what do you think is going to happen there? It's going to hurt. <laughs> it's going to hurt and it's going to move <laughs> easily, right? So if yeah. you've had a joint that moves a lot, or so he's had this facet joint dysfunction for years, it it probably didn't, wasn't the cause. It was probably because the sharp pain was lower first and it was from running. So we're, we're going to guess probably SI joint coming back to running. And then it traveled upward towards that facet joint. But in your head, you're maybe thinking that's probably the result of, and maybe it moved a little bit. But even if you went in and you tried, like, even if I went in and I tried to fix that, left facet joint because I go, oh, this is not right. If I don't fix the SI joint, that thing's not going away because that's not the problem. Or maybe I could fix that facet joint, but I can't, but I, if I do that, I'm not fixing the real problem, which is gonna be lower down at that SI joint. So even if I fix that part, the rest of it's still there. So, um, so yeah, I think you're thinking SI joint. So, and walking up the hill feels better gives them more release than anything else. And you're exactly right about um, glutes, Genevieve. That was a right on. Um, so glutes firing when you're walking up the hill. When If you can think of the glute muscles, where do they attach? Do you remember where they attach? They're like when this and like this and like this over the butt. Yeah. So glute medius, glute piriformis, which, where do they attach? Do you guys know? At the One um, is, pel pelvis, right? Um, yeah, so greater trochanter. So we get yeah. external rotation with those rotators. And we get at the sacrum, right? Yeah, the ilium. Yeah, so sacrum and greater trochanter is basically mm -hmm. where... Mm -hmm. We're getting, and then some to the ischial tuberosity, right? So we're getting, that's where our glutes are. And so um, if the glutes fire, what do they pull on? Oh, they pull on those things. 
the sacroiliac joint, yeah? Yes, I exactly. do. Yeah. So if he's walking uphill and getting relief, what can you assume might be happening? Taking the, the pressure off that stuff. Why? Because it's... Uh, uh, something about the forward motion or the forward posture. Oh, but it's the one, it's the one-legged pressure, right? So the one-legged pressure, when we walk, we, and we, especially uphill, right? We're going to fire back here. And so what I'm going to get when I fire back here is I'm going to get pull on the SI joint on one side. Mm. So he's getting relief walking uphill because it's actually pulling that SI joint into position probably with, and so it's going to probably, and I don't have this information exactly, but it's probably one leg that's stepping up, that's giving him the relief, not the other necessarily, but it's helping his sacrum come back into good alignment, right? Because it's the muscles are pulling right on that sacrum as he steps up. So it's pulling that sacrum into position for him for a moment. And then it's falling back out of position when he's vertical again. But as he steps up, he's getting that muscle to fire and pull it into position. So, and maybe you couldn't have known that already, but a lot of the work that you guys have seen me do is where I have people contract, relax against resistance. That's all called muscle energy work. And that's all so that I can get the muscles to actually pull the joints back into a good alignment. So, um, so he's actually doing a little muscle energy work himself by walking up the stairs, which is giving him that relief. So um, I know that was a lot of information and a lot of it is not stuff that you need to know, but I, I think it's just really fun to think through the process of, but why and how did this happen? And why is it happening? And how does, how did he get into it? And why does he tell you something like it gives me relief when I walk up, up um, hill? So you can, usually I think about, when I think about SI joint versus lumbar spine, for example, the things that people will say to you is, when I first get up from sitting or lying down and I put weight on my one leg, I have pain that initial pain that we call it on initial pain on initial stance on one leg often describes an SI joint issue versus a lumbar spine issue. And uh, so you can think of if they say it hurts when I put pressure on one leg versus the other leg, it could be back as well, but that first steps and then it gets a little bit better or walking up hill feels better to me because I've got a sheer and a very, if I've got one leg way up and the other one down, right? My pelvis is out of its neutral position, which is normal that we can go out, but we should go back in and it should still feel good. But if it feels bad and we put one leg up and one leg down and push, and then it feels better while we're pushing on that step, then we go, hmm, something must not be right at this pelvis area to begin with because then I'm getting relief and when I'm not, when I'm not aligned, here I'm aligned, here I'm not, but I'm getting relief when I'm not, which means that maybe when I'm here, I'm actually not aligned. And when I'm here, I'm coming into some sort of alignment, right? So that's something just to put into your world of, of thought here. And then you're not wrong about what's going on with the muscles. So in running, you're getting, hip extension behind. So if there's a facet joint issue, that's also a common problem for people who don't have enough hip extension, right? So if you don't have enough hip extension, you're gonna get extension, we've talked about this in the past, right? You're gonna get extension in the lumbar spine. And that is a great way to upset facet joints. So had he not said that I had a sharp pain in my hip, pelvis region and it feels better walking upstairs. And he had said, I have pain in my left side of my spine right here uh, when I run, then I might think along those lines, right? Maybe not enough hip extension. Maybe he's extending his back. Maybe he's not stable enough in his center to hold himself when he's running. So those are, those are all correct, really correct ways to think about it. Um, and then shortening of hip flexors going uphill, absolutely they're shortening. So they can really pull 
into a posterior pelvis direction. Yeah, they can also, so they could be moving the pelvis, but he's actually feeling better going uphill. Um, if the quads are tight, I'm trying to think, they could definitely be tightening while he's hiking. Um, so you could assume, you definitely want to check and see, do they have tight quads? Because that is something for, for hikers and people carrying load. Um, I think the body position is really important to look at too, because you're right. You're not going to be in the same body position hiking with a backpack or running. It's not the same position. And the shoes are not the same by any means. And he definitely wears one of those people that has to wear um, taller boots because he has weak ankles too. So um, he's wearing big boots and then he's wearing running shoes. Big difference as well. So even that could change where he is over his foot. And even that position could ask for a different set of muscles that he hasn't been developing while he's hiking, right? As strong as he may be. So just a lot of food for thought. Yeah, great, awesome. <laughs> All right, you guys, thank you so much. Thank you, Leah. Yeah, thank you guys.